Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning. I'm Greg Conti. This is Sergey Bradis. And we've been taking a very hard look at uh, inside binaries, inside binary objects, whether they be uh, memory, uh, memory dumps, uh, files, file systems, anywhere we find zeros and ones. And what we found is a great deal of structure, a great diversity of binary species. And I think the understanding of that will help you, whether you're a forensics engineer, a reverse engineer, a fuzzer, um, or a security researcher in general, understanding the, mo the, the building blocks of, of these binary objects. Something that's between the data type, you know, ints and longs and cars and all of that, and the object itself, you know, a, a word document, a binary word document or something. Um, so we're going to focus, we tried to document as many of these types as possible, put them into categories. We have ways in the talk to visually identify them as well as uh, statistically to identify them so it, it can I ideally be op uh, automated. And the ultimate goal is to help you do your, your jobs better, speed, speed analysis and gain insight. Well, uh, I have a bit of a personal history here. Uh, Greg was the one who put me up to it. <laughs> Um, uh, he got me interested in um, visualization, in uh, uh, leveraging the power of just the naked eye uh, when looking at the bits. Because when you get to see uh, those bits flying by or scrolling by on the screen, you sort of kind of see the patterns and you actually get to recognize the patterns. And if you shift the data around, uh, then you see the patterns in the shifting. But uh, all of this is tantalizingly close and yet really hard to actually use. So uh, what we're trying to present today is uh, ways to actually make it simpler and isolate a few visual primitives that will uh, hopefully tell something useful about a piece of a binary at a glance and uh, give you a reference uh, as to what this thing might be um, you know, it's not something that you wouldn't be able to do with more advanced tools uh, or um, special scripts, but those things will cost you. Those things will cost you uh, the time to run them, uh, the time to pre-process the data. Here, the idea is to have a visual cue that's just right there and to switch between those visual cues very, very fast. Okay, good. Uh, for bonus points, who's the, who's the picture, the bug-eyed man in the picture? Charles Darwin, very good. They had some great photographs. So um, this is my disclaimer. Does anyone read Rot 13 natively? I know no one reads it anyway, so I thought I'd make it Rot 13. Um, <laughs> so um, anyway, we're here as free citizens and not the representatives of our employers. So we're going to be using uh, several visualizations, this one most of all. Uh, if you think of any binary object, uh, whether it be memory, uh, network flow, a file, file system, it uh, consists of numbers, zeros and ones, uh, or bytes. So if you think of that sequence of bytes in this example, 255, 108, um, 40 and so on, and you plot those into a, a graphical uh, a window from left to right. So the first byte in the file is the top left corner, the second byte in the file is the next byte to the right, and the third byte and so on. And what we've done is mapped the color, the grayscale, to the byte value. So zero is black, uh, 255 is bright white, other byte values are shades uh, in between. And, and the advantage there is you can play with these color mappings and, and do all sorts of things. But the idea is this allows you, when you compare a hex editor's window to a graphical window, you, you've, you can see about 300 times more information, uh, at least in a graphical way. Uh, the, obviously a hex editor shows it in a textual way. But that allows you to see the structure. So let's take a look. So this is a Word document. Um, I've, I've snipped out 10 megs in the middle because um, it, it's, well, I'll, I'll walk through. So at the top, that's where a, a Word 2003 document, that's what ASCII text looks like. The next region is it's a data structure. And then the, the white noise area in the middle is uh, the, the uh, several compressed images. And if you look where the, that black line in the middle, the actual header, the data structure that's the header for each embedded image is, is visible between them. 
And then at the end you see other structure um, and for example that there's a table of Unicode URLs that are in the document and other data structures in there. Uh, the idea being and it goes back to what I said at the beginning that there's integers and longs and cars and then there's word documents. But really th these things, these jar files, these other, these executables are all um, built upon these primitive fragments, these primitive types, that's what we're calling them. Things that are bigger than the basic programming data type but smaller than say a container object. And let's just look at an example. So this tool should be on, we submitted it, it should be on your CD although we have not checked. And it allows you to load the file and, and bring it up. So here this is uh, shell 32 DLL and you can uh, adjust the, the width as you see fit and it'll, it'll resize it so, so if you can get to like a, a, an offset that makes or a, a window size that makes sense like the uh, different data structures in there. And then you can play through it and see the various structures. At this point in the talk, don't worry about what these structures are. We're going to go through, through that. But the idea being just that there are numerous structures inside, inside a file and it's good to know what they are and know what they look like and so on. And then you can scroll through and so on. So anyway, yes, okay. So if I may jump in at this point. Um, it's really interesting how the structure of binary files uh, is being completely ignored everywhere you go to get an undergraduate CS education. So uh, how many different sections do you expect to find in your typical uh, Unix utility? Like One, two, three, four, five. You mean elf file? Right. Elf? Yeah. Um, let's, let's say elf, right? Another four. Uh, 32. Thank you. 32. These are 32. So uh, obviously there is text and data and um, uh, some sort of a header, right? So uh, you can find four uh, quite easily. But in fact, if you look from section to section, if you look at the section table, in the modern 32-bit, 64-bit uh, machine, you will find about 32 sections in there. Uh, some of those are symbol tables. Uh, the dynamic symbol tables account for at least 10 of those uh, sections, all the sections that work together to give the dynamic linker that which it uses uh, to link in the libraries. Uh, the symbol table, the string table, so some of the uh, ASCII that you see uh, as you scroll in there and as you will see with the um, uh, BinViz tool. Uh, then um, uh, possibly even a hash table for lookups, but there are 32 different kinds of data that are different enough semantically uh, that they have a, uh, an entry into that table for their own. Just think about that, right? Uh, and uh, they are, um, well, some of them are code. Some of them are code that only works with this little bit of data, like the procedure linkage table that works with the global offset table and the dynamic linker. Uh, stitches this uh, up when, when called. But uh, there is a lot of diversity even within a single uh, executable file. There will be even more in the memory image when that file is loaded um, and uh, executing. So and just have some other examples. This is a jar file. And again, don't worry about the, what the structures are. Just note that there are different ones. Uh, this is an, an executable what Sergey was just yeah, discussing. And we can actually see we can actually see some of those uh, sections right here. So uh, this is the uh, um, elf header. Uh, what comes next uh, is the uh, section table. It's uh, right there in um, and it's uh, well it's offsets into the file uh, packed close together. Then uh, you will see you, you will see. Uh, code and you will see data and hopefully you know most of this is code. Uh, but there are, there are also strings uh, that go into uh, dynamically linking the file and uh, there are all sorts of versioning information uh, and uh, if your uh, executable is not stripped then there are uh, symbol, there is a symbol table and other kind of debugging information closer to the end. But all of those things, I mean these are these um, 30 to 32 uh, sections 
uh, laid out, and you can actually make them out very easily. Uh, and uh, you can actually make them out even more easily before the file has been uh, linked uh, together, because you've got runs of zeros where the addresses of the functions would go. So. And and, and the same goes for system memory. This is uh, from the Digital Forensics Re Research Workshop uh, data set that they released this year. It's uh, a Sony Ericsson K800. It's just a snippet from memory. Uh, and even network traffic, right? So this is a, a byte plot, but except that it only show, it shows one packet per line and kind of does a carriage return. So the long lines were large packets, the short lines are small packets. But again, the structure exists. Um, and that we argue the current tools, things like grep and strings, hex editors for this general purpose problem, just uh, they're, they're insufficient. We can do better. And that's what we're trying to get at. And, and alluded to this at the beginning, that you're going to encounter un unknown, unfamiliar structures. Uh, typically, you'll be looking at them in text. Um, and what we're trying to do by getting our arms around all the various types of building blocks, primitive uh, types out there, we can help facilitate uh, deep understanding, help you as a reverser, as a fuzzer, as a forensics analyst. Um, and we're working on something called memory mapping. And the idea is if you can take, if you can programmatically identify each of these uh, primitive types, then you can write a program that dumps out. And uh, here, here's an example. Uh, this is a memory map. Not, not say, not the uh, binary mapping. Uh, for bonus points, what is this the memory map of? Ah, Commodore. I heard Commodore 64. This is Commodore 64 memory map. But it was the intuition. Glorious, glorious um, eight bit. Uh, address yes, space. beautiful. Uh, so the uh, so the idea though, and I just so from that memory map to this idea of binary mapping, that if you have the ability, then if you understand what these fragment types are or uh, primitive types are, you can identify where they begin and end uh, within a file, and from there you can toggle them on and off and say only show me text, or I don't care about text, or show me only code, or I don't care about code, and, and slice through the file, removing a layer at a time of this unknown thing you're trying to analyze. That's the idea. Uh, another idea is that you can embed, you know, we get our arms around this, we can embed it in things like a hex editor or mocked up what, you know, there's a strings tab within, uh, within IDA. You could have a compressed tab, an encoded tab, bitmap, audio, as you have this ability to identify these things. Um, this is a, uh, a taxonomy. It's the tree of programming languages. And I thought it was very uh, useful to just show that we, this thing could grow without bounds. There's m many, many different interpretations or, or variations of binary, uh, of, of primitive types. So the idea then is we had to draw our arms around it and kind of scope what we did otherwise. It would spiral off into this incredibly you know, unsolvable problem. So what we've done is kind of define the root of the tree and uh, of things that you're likely to encounter and went into a certain level of depth here and more depth in the white paper that we released. Okay. So I would like to make a, a disclaimer. It's impossible by looking at a, a run of bytes to tell what those runs of byte, what, what those bytes are, what they do, uh, what format they belong to. It's really, really very, very hard and, uh, you know, it's provably hard. Okay. Um, however, most of the time we are not looking at those uh, incredibly disguised things such as shell code that is supposed to be the English text. Such a thing has been done. We'll mention it as we uh, bow out. Uh, but most of the time uh, you want to know what the hell is it that you're looking at. Is that a compressed uh, stretch of bytes? Is that uh, something that might be a media? Is that something that's likely to be code? So, you know, one of the great things about IDA is that, well, it's interactive, right? Uh, you get some uh, heuristics to actually uh, uh, try to guess what a uh, segment is, and then if you didn't guess right, uh, you can annotate it as uh, code, and you will have uh, a uh, uh, disassembler run over it uh, and uh, do the smart thing. But wouldn't it be nice if you could say, here is a 
something that I think is compressed with oh, gzip, or with oh, uh, um, uh, this or that uh, compressor. Or here is something that's just likely to be uh, um, encoded text. Can we detect the boundaries of that? Uh, and so on and so forth. And so it's really just about this. Before we got the DNA uh, as the uh, uh, foundation for classifying species, all that an explorer could do was go out there, catch an animal, you know, check uh, its um, check its uh, foot or tail or beak, um, and uh, drag enough of those animals back and try to systematize what the hell they were. I mean, the whole idea of the species started before Charles Darwin with uh, Carlos Linnaeus and, and others, but uh, the very idea that you know some of those things were not like the others and yet similar. Um, so a descriptive nature of biology, a descriptive nature of uh, classifying species, uh, that uh, played its role. It was useful. It helped us understand uh, deeper uh, things uh, about the species. So here we are, right? We've got all of those little creatures, some of them slimy, some of them wormy, some of them, uh, you know, with little arms and legs. Uh, and uh, they're crawling around in the binaries. And you pick one up and you look at it, right? And uh, like, what is it? How can you try to classify quickly what it is? Now, if you're a biologist, right, and you've caught yourself an animal, well, uh, you know to go for the hooves, right? That will give you a large part of the classification already. Then you look at the, well, not really, not the tail. Then you look at um, uh, some other distinguishing features. And finally, ah, you know, I've got myself a chimera. Um, but uh, so, the thing that will enable this development, we believe, is a classification, a dictionary of types. And uh, then, you know, once we assemble that, and we've whole, we, we have a whole bunch of uh, uh, binary fragments from a whole bunch of different uh, types of files um, uh, that we think uh, are a reasonable first cut at such a classification, then we can uh, Apply very simple visual checks. How many wings? What length the beak? Split hoof or, or, or what? Right? So that is the purpose of what we are uh, going to do. And uh, for that, we need to uh, come to an agreement what the primitive type is. So not something very long, uh, not something very short. Right? Not just your basic uh, integer, because how do you visually recognize an integer? You can visually recognize a small integer. You can search for um, uh, structs in memory that are known to contain small integers. If you're looking for your proc structures or your uh, uh, process structure in the Windows uh, uh, kernel memory to locate your rootkit, right? Uh, this is uh, to locate uh, uh, process structures that shouldn't be there. Um, but uh, that's a different thing. These things are, are quite large. Uh, they may be kilobytes large. We want something smaller. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we don't want to say that the, doc, that the doc file is a primitive type. Gosh, no. That thing can contain uh, everything in the kitchen sink. We can't say that a PE file, an ELF file, uh, is a primitive type. Because again, that thing is made out of many, many parts. So. Um, we need to make a design decision here. So that, that, you know, I think Sergey alluded to it. Uh, what we had to do was come up with a reasonable um, approximation of our, what, what, is too, what is too small, what is too large, and we'll show you as, as the decisions as we went along the way. Uh, but one thing to think about is if you think of a simple file, there's you know, an image file, it may have a header and then a payload. We consider those two different things. For example, the header, we consider a data structure uh, because maybe you want to know what, be able to find data structures within a file. And and then the payload may be a bitmap, it may be a compressed image. <clears throat> 
and uh, that's they're distinct. The header and payload are distinct. And also we had to come to grips with that uh, many types of en encryption, compression, and encoding occur in this this binary jungle that's out there, zoo that's out there. And how do we incorporate that into uh, thinking about this problem? As well as potentially artifacts, like in an image file, uh, in a compression scheme, there may be markers or something embedded very closely, very small markers. Are they considered part of the, the that the, the that image or that compressed block, or are they something else? So uh, there is a disclaimer here. Again, you can uh, bring on any uh, custom transformation that will completely disguise the nature of the file. Uh, however, I mean, you can pack a virtual machine that actually regenerates your. Uh, file the, just the same uh, your your actual content uh, just the same way as uh, Dwarf does uh, in many of uh, the things it does. Uh, but um, again, your typical shell code doesn't usually come with a virtual machine. Most of the time, it comes in a XOR obfuscated, or uh, you know, add it has uh, uh, the same number or you know. Um, the same uh, two byte or four byte integer added to each word of the shell code. So through those transformations, we should be able to see and look at. Okay, so in the paper we go into lower levels, but the highest level of this categorization is what you see on the left. The idea of these uh, primitive types. And to think about this problem, we looked at uh, the MIME media extensions. Uh, there's several registered, uh, the I IANA, IANA, uh, registered media, media types. Some analytic tools have binary templates. Uh, and then container file formats and, and the like. So we, we took a hard look at those. This is the highest level. Again, the paper goes into to significantly more detail below each of these. You can envision text getting into different encoding schemes than each of those being different human languages for example. Uh, and this, the, the general approach we suggest in, in trying to identify these things, alluding to the uh, identifying uh, chimera, uh, the, we have a, the byte plot view which we showed. Uh, you know, obviously looking at hex and ASCII. And we also present two other, you know, the, the idea of looking at a frequency histogram of the bytes and the digraphs, uh, the two letter sequences, uh, two, char two value sequences uh, appearing in the file. And then comparing those to dictionary uh, of other uh, similar structures. And this is the analytic approach, but we also suggest that you will find you will gain insights, and with those insights, you're going to find like statistical outliers or, or ways these things stick out, and with those, you can find automated ways to identify them. So um, think of it as a bunch of uh, antique uh, magnifying glasses. So you're in the beagle, you know, uh, you you've uh, just acquired this creature. You uh, bring them out. And you look at it through this one looking glass and say, oh, ah, ah, doesn't look like anything I know. Uh, take out another one very quickly, again, look at it through that one and say, oh, you know, the, all I can see through that uh, looking glass is the hoof or a part of the tail or that strange glowing bit. But I know what that looks like because uh, I've seen that sort of thing before. So it's really about the visual transformations of those primitive pieces that uh, nuke some or almost all of the structure out of what you're uh, viewing, but make the rest look familiar, make the rest look recognizable. And uh, biplots and uh, digraphs in particular uh, will be very helpful. So as we go through these examples, I'd, I'd ask you to think about, okay, we're looking at visually how, what stands out, but think about how it could be done algorithmically because ultimately the future lies in this, the people in this room don't scale all that well. So if we can capture your insights in an automated way, then that's, there's the real power and that could be handed off to machines to do the, the grunt work. So even in the text category, you can see, see, and with these, again, just recognize that the structure is different. And that you know, everyone in this room, or many people in this room, could write little scripts that could identify these independently because there's nice, nice handles that you can get uh, get your arms around. And but again, within the text arena, great deal of diversity. Um, so what we're going to introduce here is uh, the idea of the digraph view. 
So thinking about that, if you take the word black hat, the digraphs are the first two letters, BL. The next digraph is LA. The next digraph is AC. And so BL is, lowercase BL, is 98 and 108 in US ASCII. And then LA is 108, 97. And so you get these pairings, these, these pairs of values. And by plotting these pairs of values, you gain a quick insight into the contents of a given file or a sliding window within a file. And that's what we do. Um, which we'll uh, which we'll get to in, in a um, second. So, for you language aficionados, programming languages aficionados out there, uh, this is simply a bigram model of the language that is the binary. So, uh, you can think of uh, modeling a language as recording which word follows which word, which bytes, and uh, which byte in this particular case follows which byte, uh, and uh, you can have a table of uh, such um, uh, pairs that you observe, they're called bigrams, uh, and you can actually generate pseudo-English or something very close uh, at the first glance, or at the first, well, at the first hearing probably, I don't know. Uh, if I start uh, sputtering gibberish, you know that, that that sort of a circuit switched on in my brain. Um, uh, so the dissociated press in Emacs, the um, Markov models, of natural language, uh, that is the same idea. So you record uh, the tuples, you record uh, the bigrams. Okay. So just uh, looking at ASCII text, um, so this is the top right is this part is just a, a, a picture of it. That's the histogram, and you can see the the large values in the in near the middle. That's the lowercase characters. Uh, the the long vertical line reaching all the way to the top is the space character. We started off with text because I think everybody can kind of get their head around that pretty readily. And then this is the bigraph plot. Um, so the, this digraph. So this plot. This is what. Um, this is what ASCII text looks like. This is where it falls into. What do you think that bright region in the bottom right corner is? Yeah, lowercase characters. So that's lowercase characters, sequence pairs of lowercase characters. And then, but you'll get to the left, you'll get uppercase and then a lowercase. So you're going to see essentially that's a very distinct signature. And when you're looking at a binary, this will pop out at you when you hit text. And Unicode. Okay. Question. Yes. <laughs> On that, uh, did you do anything to represent the frequency of occurrence? Is it as more frequent or brighter, less frequent or different? This just shows uh, presence. Uh, on, on the left, yeah. And you could do that. You could color code it. Um, we, for this, it's just on or off. And you have to make a decision like uh, how far ahead do you look? Do you run the entire file through this? Then you'd have c different fragment types overlapping. So we took a sliding window approach. Yes. Uh, in fact, we do have a frequency of occurrence uh, later for a different uh, method. So I'm just loading a text file now. <clears throat> and not all that interesting, uh, but you can see it's got, this is a, a, just a, a large Project Gutenberg text file. <clears throat> One thing that we also have in the tool <clears throat> is uh, an entropy, entropy plot. So it plots alongside the, the entropy. So you can see that the entropy of English text and it, it corresponds with the line at the same level, is about 4.2, something like that, on uh, 0 to 8 bytes, 8 being the most random or most uh, unpredictable. And then bitmaps. So uh, bitmaps can exist on a file, although they're uncommon, typically they're compressed. Importantly, though, they can exist in memory. And when a program loads a, a, a compressed file in the memory, typically it decompresses it. Um, and we've got looked at memory dumps and things like that, and you can see the bitmaps uh, residing in there. Now the problem with bitmaps is that they're, where text is a very tight knot of what you could expect statistically, uh, bitmaps can be anything. You could have a bitmap of white noise, uh, or you could have a bitmap of a black square. Uh, so when you're doing this, though, common bitmaps, and that's where we have to go to commonly, what will you run into? You uh, th those those show those those stand out. Yes. We have a steganography example in here. I would say it'll work with some. Right? There's some very uh, like certain naive. The example we have flips lower bit bits, uh, at least significant bits that shows up. Um, but there's some very subtle techniques in, in current steg. Sure. 
Um, okay, so uh, the top right is a bitmap. Now that's not the looking at it with an image viewer, that's looking at it as a byte plot, plot. So because the, the, the window, the byte plot doesn't exactly represent, um, doesn't exactly, it's not an image viewer, it's looking at the raw bytes in the file. That's what it'll look like, or, or it can. Um, that's the histogram for that particular uh, bitmap. But the digraphs, particularly in, you know, normal photographs, normal images, will often look like fireworks in the digraph. Um, and, and you I'll can see the structure which is very different from what it was uh, in, for the, in, in case of the text. Even if this were SOAR encoded or shifted in some way, the picture would look the same. It would just shift around in that view. Uh, and that is the power of a simple visualization uh, primitive. So that's your, you know, antique lens number one. So here we're looking at three. The bottom left corner, if I get it right. You can kind of you can start kind of seeing it. Um, so the bottom this on the uh, here this part is the the uh, digraph view. Off here to this side is the entropy view. Uh, yes. Uh, it's one entropy reading per line. So and and right now it's fixed to the default. Um, so here. It, it comes out at 640 by 480 in the byte plot view. So each line of this uh, byte plot equates to the, the location of the entropy. Yeah. If you resize this, the byte plot view, the entropy doesn't resize along with it. Yeah. For entropy, you need a distribution. So you just decide on the window in which you take that distribution. And, and yeah, I mean, there are many ways you could do it. You can add tuning knobs to all of these things. But then as you go through the file, you can see that this, you know, the changes as you go. And again, this is just one example. But what we found, we've looked at a lot of examples, and what we're showing you are things that we've seen appear time and time again. Uh, so we're not suggesting these weird one-off examples, unless we tell you it's a weird one-off example. Yeah. Uh, here's a weird one-off example. Uh, to the left is, uh, yeah, to the left is a picture, and it, uh, inside that picture, in the two least significant bytes, is another picture. All right, so of a cat, and all cats are named Mr. Jingles, so that's Mr. Jingles. Um, and here's the view. So what do you notice about it? Actually, let me make it bigger. Okay, you can see something weird going on here. So for the person who asked the steg question, you know, it, it, manipulating lower order bits, if you've got two levels of things, yeah, it, it may very well show up. It depends on, again, it depends how much you're putting in there and how similar the things are, but it, you've got a good chance. Yeah, so it's a familiar beak, but it also is something else. It can probably open beer bottles. And there's, um, and, but there's many different image formats. So there's, there's, many, there's a great deal of depth as you think through this of ways images can be, if you want to identify them programmatically, for example, or try to, there's different ways they're encoded. So you have to think those through. Uh, audio is another good example. Again, it can be compressed, but it, could, it has to be uncompressed at some point to actually uh, typically be used. So here's an example. This is uh, a wave file. Uh, notice the U-shaped, the very distinct high and low bytes for a wave file. And this is a, um, a 44 kilohertz, 16-bit per channel PCM encoded audio. Um, and here, the digraph is very distinct. This is Sweet Home Alabama. And sadly, when you press the play button on this, it doesn't actually play the song. Uh, okay, so you can see there is structure. It's a different structure. You know, you're not going to get a picture emerge. Uh, but, and then the entropy does change. But I'm going to hit play here. And actually, I'll probably speed this up. See, it changes pretty significantly as you go through. So the idea is with these insights, how can you programmatically identify these things? Now we know the digraph has that characteristic. And you can see the entropy as well. Now these are pure fragments, so we're not looking at mix, we're looking at individual primitive types here, essentially. But you, t you could take a sample out of a larger file and quickly categorize those samples, even if the file were, for example, XORD. Yes, or, or the, the, the um, the BinViz tool will allow you, you can just slide to that offset and take a look. Uh, compressed audio, and this is a theme you're going to see again and again. Um, 
compressed audio and encrypted and random numbers typically exhibit very little structure as they as they're intended. But if you think about the nature of each of those ca uh, categories, compression typically wants to be reversed, right? It's a it's a reversible process. Um, encryption wasn't designed to be a random number generator, so there are perhaps some statistical characteristics that distinguish it from um, from random numbers themselves. And just taking a look now at this MP3, there is some structure there. Um, and the, looking at it, and this is a, a view I just want to touch on briefly. It's a, a, Dan Kaminsky used it. It's called the dot plot. Uh, the link to the original paper, and then uh, Dan Kaminsky's talk there. But the basic idea is it's a measure of self-similarity, measure of structure within a file. And if you take a sequence of, of values, byte values or words, here to be or not to be, and you plot them on the horizontal and vertical axes. Where they coincide, where two appears in, you know, the same word appears on both axes, you plot a point. That's the basic idea. So just like the digraphs are a measure of a bigrams, this is a measure of self similarity. And this is the MP3. And you see there is structure in there. You might not notice with the, the with eye, you almost certainly won't recognize it with a hex editor, uh, or you might not. So anyway, these are just, again, once you've found that, you say, well, what caused that? And you can kind of narrow it down and then maybe find a way to use that to your advantage. Uh, video is essentially sequence, uh, uncompressed video, full frame video, uh, just uh, is, uh, the AVI format's just image after image, like a flip book. Uh, compressed images uh, often will have a keyframe, which is uh, the, a full frame, and then uh, a so followed by some sequence of frames that just show the difference followed by the keyframe. So this is just looking inside a compressed AVI. And it, it, again, it's useful to see these pictures so as you're looking at these things, you can't really tell this from a hex editor. Um, Windows PE file. Uh, now this, we won't say there, it's the same primitive type in there. I mean, if you look at the text region, at the bottom there's a, you know, a table of strings. So mixed with the code at the top. So the text at the top is what code looks like typically. And then the, in the resource section, our SRC section has you know, bitmaps and other different types of structure embedded. So there, but it's useful to, I thought it'd be interesting to actually see what you know, the sections looked like because you spend a lot of your time in those sections. And then looking at this command.exe as well. So now looking specifically at machine code, uh, we looked at a lot, and we have some statistical analyses at the end. This is just one example. Uh, but you get a, a histogram or a digraph plot that looks kind of like a grid. So if you're going through this file and you see that grid appear, that, that tells you that it may be machine code because we found that there's not all that many common primitive types out there that you, once you get a handle of what they look like, you can start identifying them on the fly. This is the ever popular calc.exe, probably the most analyzed program in the world. Okay, so at the top, um, so as we play this, note, um, so this is the grid that I was discussing. You'll see that grid, and the t this top part, the top half of the file is essentially all grid. And you can see that's what it looks like. And then as you transition, you'll see it, give, it, it popped briefly when it hit strings. Yeah, by the way, you just saw a piece of, uh, a piece of text, which is the. Right yes, there. Which so is right, that's, table. that's the string table. And then you get into the images that look like fireworks. All right, so you get the fireworks kind of at the end. You'll all, and this is, an, as we said, bitmaps could be anything. Data structures, typically you know them when you see them. Uh, oftentimes they'll be blanks, the, uh, they have a great deal of structure, pardon, pardon the pun. But um, they're visually very recognizable, but they could theoretically contain, you know, random numbers. <laughs> so they kind of, but in common practice they look like this. So what are the statistical signatures like? Is there a way that you can pull out data structures? And as you'll note that we're, we're, we're not talking about knowing a priori the um, file format in advance. The, um, or, or any, we're not assuming any knowledge. You could combine that with certain knowledge if you know a file format, what's it, what should be expected at a given spot. But we're not assuming that. And again, random numbers. Look like random numbers. 
Uh, the flip side of random numbers, padding, repeating values, and the like. Uh, are, are again very easy, but you do see that. So we included that in our thinking about this problem. Um, and then there's the idea of transformation. So we've largely looked at the kind of the raw, the base primitive types, but they can undergo many, many transformations. Some uh, encryption, compression, encoding being the most common. And if you think about an image, an image on a camera, maybe an uncompressed image, a TIFF file or, or something like that, and you load it onto your computer, you load it into image editor, you edit it, you save it as a compressed version. That compressed version may be sent over you know, a protocol that uses encoding, text encoding. So these transformations occur. When that, when that uh, compressed image is loaded into memory, it's uncompressed. So the, it's going to, you're, what one thing will like at different points in this game will be different. But oftentimes the, you can find some signatures will often pop through. So this is just a, a Windows PE file that's base64 encoded and you can see the, the text region at the top still is visual, uh, visible. And also the, uh, the, the vertical lines there, are, are, it, yeah, you see that as a common um, artifact within base64 encoded files. Um, sometimes other artifacts like this, this chunk here, I, I drew diagonal lines on the top and then there's a, a mirror image on the bottom, that there may be artifacts in there that you didn't know and that you can use to your advantage. Uh, UP, this is a UPX file, I think a compressed file, I think it's cmd.exe. And at the top though, it, it by default it only compressed the, uh, the code region and the other structures there. So you can see a kind of um, certain times structure pops through. And this code would not look like the code in the uh, byte plot. Yeah, it would look like a compressed, more like the, the white noise, the Starfield kind yes. of look. Uh, and then encrypted looks a lot like random. Um, and then it's also useful to think in terms of um, the obfuscation techniques people will do within their code. And there's a wide variety people can use. We've chosen just a couple of examples to illustrate. Uh, if you, uh, you know, adding and subtracting a constant, at, at looking at a hex editor, you know, things will look, look different, right? But uh, other properties shine through with the right magnifying glass, the right window. So here's one that we've shifted each by 150 and wrapped around if it exceeded 255. Um, and by adding a constant, it's, it's useful to think of that as a shift cipher, right? That uh, you're just shifting two alphabets side by side. But in the frequency distribution, still in the same order, it's just slid and uh, it, you just shifted it. And the same thing, like XORing a file, uh, XORing a value. So you've got a key, a randomly chosen key that you're XORing with the, every value, 8 bit XOR, um, yields a set of, of values. And, but depending on the key you choose, uh, it can, there can be any mapping between the plane and cipher. So this 8 bit key is really the equivalent of a monoalphabetic substitution cipher. But still, structure pops through that because even with a limited, well, uh, a limited number with one key like that, it, there's a reason why one time pads have an infinite uh, or have a, a key applied, a random value XORed with every value in a file because otherwise structure pops through. So anyway, thinking from 8-bit uh, XOR to 16-bit XOR, you, you have um, eight, 16 bits. So the first eight bits is key one applied to byte one. And applied to the second eight goes to byte two and then you reuse the keys. And essentially what you've got is a two alphabet polyalphabetic, uh, poly, um, poly, I'm losing my mind. Yeah, there. one of those. Yeah, polyalphabetic. Uh, so you've got a two alphabet polyalphabetic cipher. And if you've done a 32 bit XOR, you have four bytes, essentially, and you keep using, or four keys, and you're reusing those. So essentially, you have four alphabets. So what you'll see on the diagram, for example, is that you're, you'll be seeing double or quadruple of the usual picture. But it will still be the usual picture because neither of those methods actually destroys your bigrams. It transforms them, makes them into different bigrams, but does not destroy them entirely. Demo? Sure. Um, and then as I mentioned before that if your number of keys uh, go all the way up to the, match the number of bytes, if you're, then you hit uh, a one-time pad. So that what you're talking about, those, those values become more and more diffused as you increase the, the size of the key. And I think, so demo time. So let's see that. 
Okay, so I'm not going to tell you what these are, so you have to tell me what they are. Okay. So the byte plot, what does that look like? It looks kind of text like, okay. And I'll get, uh, th so that is correct. And then if you f adjust the size, you get lined up right. What do you see in the middle? Yeah, you can see vertical bars. But look at the digraph plot. Rem remember, if it was all uppercase and all lowercase, you should just have the lower right block being, you know, the common digraphs. But we're seeing digraphs of many pairs within the printable ASCII range. Bing, good. This is base 64 encoding. Okay. So the first part is you see what what does this indicate? The the digraph view indicates what? Yeah, it, it, it now we're Actual. we're doing something here though. And actually let me let me slot do this. Okay? As I slide through the file it's shifting. So think back to the addons, adding and subtracting a constant is a simple encoding technique. So here we've added zero. If you go uh, through the file, like say in this bottom right corner, we've added 255 to every value. So what it's done is shifted it all the way to the right. So again, this shows you that just simply adding or subtracting a value, it's kind of like a known plain text attack, right? You know it's uh, ASCII text going in. If you try and obscure it with um, just a, uh, a simple adding or subtracting a constant, remember shift cipher, it, uh, it just shifts, literally shifts the digraph. So and you here is a looking glass that sees through that obfuscation. Yeah. And then as you slide, you can notice as you go through the file, it gets brighter and brighter because it's getting higher and higher order bits until it wraps around. And then back down. Okay. So what we've done here is you see this rainbow effect? We've applied an, um, a key to each of those, an 8 bit key. Um, 8 bit XOR. So we've, we've chosen a random 8 bit key and applied it to, uh, I think it's 20 lines at a time. So you can see this rainbow effect where it's chosen to XOR a different range. But as you play this, you can see that, that the structure still is there. You've, you've done 8 bit XOR and it's still, regardless of the key, where this is like exhaustively going through the entire key space, and you can see that each of the potential keys still has a distinct st structure shining through. And part of it is th this, there's that one region, that, that darker block, that, you know, here it's in the top left, that you, that you can think about that given the key that was chosen, the input was very high in a certain range, 32 to 127, but actually probably lowercase letters, th that range is what shines through. And then even if you do 16-bit XOR, so it's just two alphabets, right? So when the, al when the keys, uh, you, you can see the two alphabets here popping through in, in this uh, attractor, I'm sorry. So you can see the, the two, one key had the effect of shifting it here, the other key put it down in the lower left quadrant. And then as you play through and different keys are chosen, they, sh they show up in different places. So this is an indicator of text being XORed with a, um, you know, 16 bit key. Yeah, you would get the same effect if you composed two uh, very different languages uh, that have their own uh, natural uh, digraph structure, nat natural bigram structure, uh, but uh, they just simply don't mesh. Either that or you're seeing double. So this one's a little different. When I coded it, I, um, I forgot to do one thing. So I, it, when I wrote this, I intended, okay, this is going to be 32-bit XOR. But as it turns out, um, I only uh, made, it's really 24-bit XOR and the last key, the, the, third, the fourth value was zero. So what you see then are these vertical lines here. All right, see the, the vertical lines, that's because every fourth uh, byte value is zero. And I confirmed that by looking at it. But anyway, it showed you something was amiss. That even when we play this though, this is essentially 24 bit XOR. You can see the different alphabets still popping through the key, or popping through the obfuscation technique. 
and it might be hard to see, but at the, the die graph, if you think about one, if one of the keys is zero, um, you, you've got die graphs here then, so, uh, I'm sorry, not if one of the keys is zero. Yeah, it, it, you, you get die graphs of, uh, the bytes of the key. yeah, the bytes of the key at the, at the top and at the bottom. Okay. I think that was it for these. Okay, so I think. Let's go on. Yeah. So we've shown you visually what this looks like. Now we've done, now each of these lines is a thousand samples as pure as we could make them of that given type. So at the top, um, we have random examples, encrypted examples, compressed examples, um, and the left red box is average byte value. The right va uh, line or right box is uh, the uh, entropy, Shannon entropy. So what we have is, um, so you see high entropy, you know, this cluster. And then, but you notice that there's statistically difference, uh, difference between the encoded version, still the high entropy, we encoded zip files, uh, but the average byte values are significantly different. Machine code, against significantly different. Bitmaps, but with bitmaps, recall that they could be anything, so they're very diverse in our samples, and the, the standard deviation there is 69, which is huge, which means it's all over the place. And then text, um, again, a pretty consistent view. So we plotted those, uh, one uh, entropy versus byte value, and the idea is there's intuition here that we can programmatically detect some of these things. Uh, you've got, a, now the high entropy cluster, it's really hard, that's a non-trivial problem to, to pull that apart, but as a unit, the idea of you know, high entropy, uh, that can be detected pretty straightforward. Uh, pulling out the base 64 encoding and, and UU encoding, pretty straightforward from our experiments. Of course there's going to be noise and there's going to be things, you, unanticipated things. Machine code stands out, ASCII text uh, and bitmaps. And it would be interesting in the, in the future to draw these boxes based on the standard deviations, you know, to kind of get a feel for how big each region is. It's a little bit bigger or, or smaller than the, the marker that we've used. So, and these are only two, uh, these are only two um, possible statistics that you can throw at the thing. Mm. They are really, uh, yeah, and they are really well known, well understood and simple. Now imagine what you can do if you take uh, uh, an aggregate of uh, 10 or more statistics. What kind of clusters would emerge? Some of those actually do catch the artifacts of compression uh, and um, of particular kinds of encryption, especially if the key is not chosen wisely and if proper padding is not applied. So you might actually be able to visually detect uh, decrypt, uh, encryption with a key uh, that wasn't chosen properly or uh, with a key with, or where the right padding scheme, scheme uh, was not used. Uh, now let's do something else. <laughs> let's try to see visually how some things are like the others and others are not. Uh, the inspiration here is this wonderful, wonderful uh, work done by two physicists who managed to reproduce almost entirely the phylogenetic tree of languages by taking the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in every language in which it, in which it was written and compressing those uh, files uh, together and separately and noticing how much better they actually compress together. The idea being that while you're compressing one file, you are uh, already working up a string table, and that string, string table helps you compress the other file better. And so this is what we did to binary fragments. And you get those uh, bathroom tile kind of uh, pictures where you have many fragments of different types. You group them, and then you see how well or what the compressed file would look like. So in this byte plot, I'm taking uh, a, a Linux x86 executable uh, and compressing it with the uh, rest of the uh, x86 Linux executables, so it's home team, so to say. And uh, instead of collapsing the strings that are in my string table for compression, which is how the Lempel zip compression works. Instead of collapsing them, I color them in their entirety with the color that um, 
the, 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 darker, uh, the darker it is, uh, the more frequent that um, uh, string, the, the more frequently that string is known to appear in that uh, corpus. And so you see that uh, there are pretty long runs of, uh, far, of, of uh, strings that were found. So uh, those are verbatim uh, repeated in other files like that. Whereas if I, config, if I compress it with uh, my bunch of bitmaps, uh, it doesn't look so good. In fact, uh, I, get, uh, I don't get long blocks at all. Uh, I get short blocks and some of those are just bytes which means uh, I ran out of uh, my uh, string table and uh, I am not seeing uh, the same strings that I was seeing when I was generating the string table. Uh, now, some of those things are more like the others. This is the executable code uh, compressed with music. And you see certain periodic structure, these things actually uh, occur in code as well. Uh, but they're not long and their distribution is strange. So uh, these are the, the, those triples that you know, could be executable code. So uh, I'm going to show that um, with luck, I'm going to show that live, do, I have the, do we have the time? A couple of minutes. Let's see if this works. Uh, if, uh, if this doesn't, uh, then uh, we'll give you the demo. Okay. Huh. Shall we attempt to switch this? All right, great. Great. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, this is a very visual cat ogling the, the binaries, sorry. <laughs> All right, so uh, here is a uh, particular uh, bit of binary code compressed with its uh, native uh, data set. Here is the bitmap that we've seen. How does it look when I compress it with bzipped text? Well, again, not so good. Uh, what happens if I compress it with uh, encrypted text? Uh, samples. Again, uh, you don't see any long blocks here. And so you can uh, go through uh, the different kinds and see where you're getting uh, longer runs that are common to that data set. Let's look at uh, the windows. So it's not quite the home team, but not quite the antagonist. And you actually see a little bit of similarity here. Uh, some of those, uh, you know, the, some of those uh, byte runs generated by the compiler are like the others, and some are not. And so you can, uh, this is a little processing application. Uh, uh, this is the music example, and um, so it goes. Compressing things together with uh, random files does not help much, because you don't get to see much of the similarity. So uh, that way, you can very quickly spot um, sharing of substrings, byte substrings, uh, between uh, two files. So, and this is uh, nothing but a uh, very simple limpulsive uh, compression with counting of uh, the uh, occurrences, the frequency of the occurrences of the uh, strings on the table. And uh, let's go back to A. Okay, good. So we uh, just to kind of recap, we you know we showed you the insight that we saw visually the statistical outliers, and then the the fact that there are just statistical differences, and you can use statistical signatures, you can use what Sergey uh, basically is a compression-based classifier, and other techniques. Uh, so thinking about this. Uh, it, as we move forward, obviously there's the bitmap diversity and data, stru data structure diversity problem that they could be anything. But we believe in practice they typically aren't very, there's enough similarity there that they could be identified. Uh, the, that cluster of high entropy types, it's, it's hard to separate those, particularly in small sizes. Um, I think we've gotten a reason, you know, 
following things as they're transformed, um, sometimes the transfer transformation is so severe nothing really shows through. Other times it does, like in our examples. Uh, and also, like to uh, actually, you were going to comment on the uh, yes, yes. So uh, it is a the technique. It is well known that you can disguise things. So uh, my favorite uh, disguising tool, uh, early disguising tool, is John Erickson's Dissembler, uh, which takes uh, shell code and translates it into ASCII-only shell code, so that the byte uh, codes are uh, just printable ASCII. Uh, recently, that uh, a similar thing, but with an enormous amount of overkill, has been done by this academic group. Uh, they actually not only made it printable, they made it sort of uh, indistinguishable from English text by uh, assembling uh, those printable instructions into words, English words, then compensating for the side effects of those instructions, and the whole thing took um, uh, hours, many hours on uh, a cluster to fit the purpose of that shell code. And in the end, you have a short essay that kind of sort of makes, well, no, it doesn't make sense. Yes, it does actually, well, it's more like a postmodern thing. Uh, <laughs> But it is actually a runnable shell code, which blunders in doing what it does, but gets there. Um, uh, so you can make uh, data uh, look like you can make code look like data. You can make data look like code uh, if you have to throw if if you throw enough computational power at it. Uh, it's possible to obfuscate things to hell, um, but nevertheless. Normal code, normal data that even even uh, mal code uh, that is in commercial production uh, doesn't have to do that as an engineering necessity. And um, you know, you look at the shell code out there, you don't see that much of uh, um, very very deep obfuscation there as well. So uh, it's not all XOR, but uh, it's certainly a lot of XOR. Uh, so uh, we have this uh, talk. Uh, we have the underlying um, classification in this paper. Well, this is really uh, something of uh, an academic paper. You will find it on your CDs uh, as our white paper to go with our talk. And uh, we try to go a lot deeper into the classification of those uh, binary fragments. Uh, and uh, we try to um, uh, distinguish them by simple transformations that discard all but the uh, most showing of that structure, as we, uh, you know, those looking glasses, uh, those uh, magnifying glasses uh, that we've tried to um, convince you work. Uh, and then for the future. So again, we just kind of the theme that there's the potential here then for automated identification. Uh, the idea of using uh, classification techniques, clustering techniques, state of mind techniques, combining all of that to combine some way to, to pr have automation helpful. Um, you could incorporate uh, you know knowledge about what comes before some probabilistic knowledge, like one you know data type typically follows an, one primitive type typically follows another primitive type or a, a known offsets in a file format. Um, it'd be nice to extend the set. And I like the idea of memory map, a tool that you can just pour any binary at and it'll give you its best guess at what the, the map is, preferably with a plug-in architecture. So we're uh, going to be wandering around Black Hat and DEF CON. Welcome, uh, we welcome feedback. Um, it, I think it'd be interesting that some of those people have obfuscated shell code, like those English shell code. It, I think it'd be fun to see what that looks like. I haven't done that, but I bet it would show kind of this, this hybrid characteristic of the machine code view and the uh, and what ASCII looks like. So it could be it could be interesting to, for someone who want to take a look at that. Um, so if we the paper, the white paper we actually put a lot of thought and effort into that. So uh, if it, we, it should be on the CD, if not, we're happy to get it to you. We'll have it up on the web shortly. Uh, and then there's some uh, our set of CDs. You know, or sh again, should be on the web on the disc. 
um, that has a slide, so you don't have to copy it down. But we have kind of we've been working this theme for a couple of years now, and this is the latest evolution of where it is. So there's some previous work that might be interesting. Uh, the BinViz tool that we used, uh, the source code and executable should be on your CD. If not, we'll have it up on the web shortly. And I wanted to point out that uh, Marius, and I can't pronounce his last name, Wishy, um, is, has done some work extending BinViz, uh, an earlier version of it, um, as a Google Code project. Um, so it'll work cross-platform was, was his intent. I'm not sure where it stands and I haven't personally used it, but I did want to tell you that's out there. Um, we also like to uh, thank our co-authors uh, on the white paper. And with that, uh, did you want to uh, invite people to come to Dartmouth to take questions? <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and take questions. Uh, yep. Um, you, you're defining primitives and, and you're showing you know, how those visually are coming out. Um, are you, is there any interest or you have in the future of uh, research towards finding uh, the easily definable structures within the primitives? In other words, you have the code log, but are you going to define like this is a type of code and this is a type of code? Uh, that's quite possible, yes. Uh, we try to isolate uh, the purest, what we judge to be the purest examples, uh, but uh, certainly as with uh, your typical biological classification, mm -hmm. as it used to be done before you could actually sequence DNA, uh, the boundaries are blurry. And you can find, you can define subspecies. In fact, you can get in, in, in the fight with other biologists over whether this is a subspecies or just a local variety. Uh, so uh, what we wanted to do was to basically give you the uh, tools to try looking at whatever data you are working with uh, so that you would develop this intuition for what the basic types are and what they look like in those uh, plots that suppress out most of their structure but keep something that's characteristic of that particular type, uh, like the digraph or like the zip thing. Yes? Uh, yes, so I know, uh, the, uh, so uh, this is a, 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 a wonderful question. Um, it has finally propagated to the, uh, um, um, you know, lar to the larger uh, academic mindset that uh, much of the code uh, that is written now is actually written by mutation of existing code. Uh, and Alva Couch has a really nice article uh, in the Usenix login on programming with ritual and alchemy, which is uh, a wonderful name, which is basically, uh, you know, you uh, get some code off of the web, as an example, you paste it in. It kind of works. You go on the web for, example, for, for how to fix it so that it actually does work. And uh, this is as removed from good practices as possible. This is as removed from what people actually teach as good practices as possible. However, he found himself doing that with a particular version of Hadoop that they wanted for a research paper and so hence the programming with ritual and alchemy. So there is quite a lot of code floating around and there are uh, better metrics than just you know uh, mutual compression uh, to throw at it. In fact, um, I think I know uh, a thesis that is looking uh, a student who is looking in, into this in his thesis. Uh, so um, uh, um, I'm not sure how much I can say, but uh, uh, if you are interested in this, uh, please contact me. I'll uh, put you in contact with them. Uh, but definitely, there is a lot of. Uh, uh, there is a lot of mutation of code going on uh, through us cut and pasting humans. Uh, have you tried 
difference is their position to be executable? Well, what we've done is up to uh, 24 bits uh, plotting, uh, well, there's a view in there, red, green, and blue to a given, so uh, the, fir the first of uh, the, uh, the first eight bits is to the red, the second eight bits is to uh, green, and then the last eight bits uh, is blue. We haven't tried above that. Uh, but I think ideally we'd write, I think where we're heading with, I think, is this happening? I think where we're heading with this is something that can handle anything from one bit up to n bytes, right? And you can change the views to look at whatever layer you want, and because every, it isn't an eight bit boundary world. And it would be nice to be able to tune, you know, set arbitrary boundaries as you explore these things. Uh, I didn't mean like the um, color graph, but it's like if you had a graph of like the position, like y being um, the numerical value of that 32 bit integer. Uh, yes, yes. So we were looking into this, and we were looking into off, into what may be offsets as well. Uh, we applied this to uh, captured uh, memory of, at, on Solaris, as it happened, uh, because of D-trace. It's, it's it's very fun, uh, and uh, there are definitely structures there. Uh, it's uh, they are not uh, the primitive structures in that they're not local. There, um, you know, it's so it's it's hard to just take a snapshot of of a piece of memory, a, a small piece of memory, and suppress it down to something like the digraph and see them. But there is uh, there is definitely uh, a structure, and you can see uh, uh, heaps, for example, they stand out. Uh, you can see um, uh, uh, slabs, they stand out. Uh, um, let's see, uh, I should have given, uh, I, I will put the pointer to that project, uh, to that student, uh, again, it's a student project. I will put that project, uh, pointer to that project online. So, yeah, it's, um, we hesitated to bring that um, uh, here because, uh, first of all, it doesn't really um, fit with the binary, with, with the primitive fragments uh, kind of thing. Um, and uh, secondly, there are uh, other people like uh, Danny Quist uh, looking at graphs per se. So if you look at his uh, recon talk uh, or his his uh, previous recon talk or his uh, talk here, uh, um, he he used uh, uh, a hypervisor to look at graph structures that you get, that you get to see at that runtime. And then pointers actually do play a role. All righty then. Well, um, yes? Um, you talked a little bit about using it to analyze network packets, but you didn't really show how to use the tool to do that. So uh, that would be uh, the rainfall visualization that Greg came up with. Uh, You're on a wire mic, is that helpful? Yes. Um, so we have done. Uh, this uh, for network packets as well. The project's older, so it was uh, the Rumit tool, R-U-M-I-N-T, uh, has a, a view that will allow, that's where that one picture was generated. Uh, it has probably about 20 different views. Uh, I haven't worked on it in about two years, uh, but it, it'll handle, uh, well, I switched from network packets over to binaries, is kind of, is so it kind of evolved from there and went down this binary path. Uh, but it's out there and the source code's out there too, and it has uh, a variety of different windows in there. So the problem there uh, is that with the packet, uh, it's hard to determine what the peer group is. So uh, for entropy measures to work, for example, uh, you need to take a, a, an, an E distribution. <coughs> so taking a distribution over a single packet doesn't seem to work so well. So you need to get some idea of the session, but you know, in fact, you're trying to discover what the session is. And so it's a little bit more tricky. But it's, uh, we're definitely planning to do something along these lines later. Yeah. Let's see how successful we'll be. Okay. We're out of time, so. All right, well, we're out of time. Um, if you're interested in a graduate degree uh, that disguises hacking as research, as academic research, consider Dartmouth. <laughs> consider our lab at Dartmouth. Um, well, here we go.